morning. It's good, morning. It's good to be with you all. I invite your attention to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Jonah, chapter 3. Brother Gabe and the brethren extend their greetings to you. He wanted me to make sure I told you that. Jonah chapter 3. I've had a chance to study this book lately, and I, I love this book. It's a, it's a blessed book full of the gospel, full of Christ. And for our first message today, I'd like to consider chapter 3. And look with me here at, at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Jonah, then you'll find that introduction to the chapter to be pretty familiar. If, if you recall what happened in chapter 1, I'd like to quickly go through this. If Look back at chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. We see the command twice. Why did God give this command twice? Well, we see what happened here, what Jonah did in response to the command in verse 3. It says, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And I'll just point out, Tarshish, this was total opposite direction of where God told him to go. Yeah. Total opposite direction. And I read it's about twice as far as Nineveh would have been in the other direction, okay? Look what it says here. He, he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This is God's prophet. This is his child. This is his prophet, his preacher. God's word had come to him. And he says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. You cry out against them. Preach to them. Jonah said no. And, not, and he said it strongly with his actions. And it, it amazes me. Every time I read this, this is God's prophet. And look what he did. Amazing. Amazing. But I rejoice to know, as God always does, He would overrule Jonah's evil Amen. for good. He always does. Amen. You know, we think about that. We say that when we see the evil in this world, but I hope we see it in the evil in ourselves. Mm -hmm. That God overrules my evil for good, Amen. and He's been pleased to do it for my good. Mm -hmm. Rejoice to know that. I won't read it all, but in verse 4 it says that, that, that God, you know, Jonah, he fled. But then God sent a great wind and a mighty tempest into the sea so that the ship that Jonah had boarded was like to be broken. And we go on to read that there are some men on this ship, some mariners, some sailors, and these men were scared to death. They start chucking things off the boat left and right, trying to lighten it so it don't sink. They start crying out foolishly, every one of them, to their own God, God of their imaginations. What's Jonah doing all the while? He's down in the sides of the ship, fast asleep. <laughs> Took him a nice snooze. <laughs> and he was in deep asleep. He was in deep sleep. And um, perhaps, I've heard it said, maybe that was a picture of Christ sleeping in the midst of the storm. But I know this. If you read this account, it was a sinful sleep. But by God's grace, he woke him up. He sent the captain of that ship down there and woke him up. Said, what in the world are you doing, you sleeper? Get up. Cry unto your God. He might be able to do something about this storm we're in. And they, I don't know much about this, but they cast lots. One way or another, God showed these men, Jonah's the man you're looking for. <laughs> He's the reason for this trouble that you're in. And in that, he surely represents our father Adam, doesn't he? By one man. Sin entered into the world, death by sin. Death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And Jonah, I believe, by the grace of God, God used him in the midst of his rebellion. God used him, overruled him, to tell these men, these lost religious men, who God was. They said, who are you? What's your name? Where'd you come from? What you doing here? <sighs> Time to fess up, Jonah. <laughs> he told them who he was. He told them what he'd done. He told them who God is. He said... 
He said, you see that, that dry land over there you're trying to get to? Let me tell you about the God of the dry land and of the sea. He's God over all. And God in His mercy sent His Spirit and blessed those words to their hearts because they weren't crying out unto their gods anymore. <laughs> After Jonah got done talking to them, and he told him what had to happen. He said, you're going to have to throw me off of here. <laughs> Imagine how scared Jonah must have been. Mm -hmm. yeah. Terrified, I'm sure. <laughs> but it said that they cried unto the Lord. They threw him out. They, they did so fearfully. They prayed to the Lord about this. They sought the Lord. Hey, we don't, we don't want innocent blood to be on our hands. But at the same time, we need, a, we need deliverance from this. We don't want to die because of what he's done. Well, nonetheless, God used Jonah. He used his prophet as the physical means to save them from the storm. It said, Jonah said, take me up and you cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. And when they did that, it says the sea ceased from her raging. God used him to physically deliver them, but he used them as his prophet to save their souls. <laughs> Bless my heart to know that. Well, and he gave us a good picture of Christ in the process, didn't he? If you notice, the last verse here of chapter 1 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Our Lord said in the New Testament, these men were asking for a sign, and our Lord said there's one sign that's going to be given to you. That's what we just read. <laughs> that's the sign of the prophet Jonah. He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What he's saying is what happened here was a picture of Christ. Yeah. Well, you know, I remember hearing about this story as a kid. It's a very maybe the most popular Bible story. But if we don't see Christ in it, we, we've missed it. It'll, it'll do us no good. And that's the case with all the scriptures. If we don't see Christ, we can learn how to be a good husband, learn how to be a good son, a good brother, a good friend. But if we don't see Christ, we've missed it. We've missed it. Now, some things that this means for us. I, as Jonah disobeyed the Lord his God, First of all, so do I. So do we constantly. But as it was with Jonah, so it is with all God's people. God will correct us. We're His children. As a father loves his children, so the Lord corrects and pities those that fear Him, His children. And He did so here by putting Jonah in a whale's belly. <laughs> I, I don't reckon I'll ever be corrected quite like that. But we read in chapter 2 that Jonah... Now Jonah's crying out unto the Lord. He said, by reason of mine affliction, he said, I did this to myself. I brought this on myself. <laughs> and I think the Lord taught him. I know the Lord taught him. The Lord in mercy put me here in this fish. He could have killed me in that storm. That's what I deserve. Yeah. He used Jonah to save those sailors, and he used that fish to save Jonah. <laughs> Amazing. God truly moves in mysterious ways, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, my. You read through chapter 2, it, Jonah, he, he was miserable. He said, I sank to the bottoms of the mountains. He, he said, Lord, I know, I know you cast me into the midst of this sea. This was, this was your will, Lord. You did this. And it's a beautiful picture of Christ, Christ on the cross, Christ in the grave. Towards the end of chapter 2, Jonah, he, he came to this point. He said, my soul fainted within me. God reduced that man to nothing. He made him feel absolutely miserable. And when he did, it said, he remembered the Lord. <laughs> you, you know, we can see the purpose in the trials when it brings us to Christ, can't we? Yeah. Say, so, you know what? I, yeah, I was miserable, but it was for a reason. Amen. The Lord had a good purpose in it. Yeah. And he used Jonah to pen perhaps one of the most beautiful, glorious phrases in all the scripture. Jonah 2, verse 10, salvations of the Lord. Yeah. That's our hope, isn't it? Yeah. Salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And now, after that, in, in spite of Jonah, in spite of his sin, in spite of his rebellion, thinking he knows better than God, God is going to use his prophet to go to Nineveh, where he was supposed to go in the first place, and God's going to use him to preach to these men, preach God's word to them, preach Christ to them, and God's going to save them. Chapter 3, verse 1 again. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Praise God for that. Yeah saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. What he bid him? He said, Cry out against them. That's what he said. Verse 3. 
So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Nineveh was a mighty city. The, the biggest city I've been to is New York City. It's big. I, I, I don't know exactly how big Nineveh was. In chapter 4, we're told there was more than 120,000 babies. So it's believed there was upwards of a million people, maybe more. They compare this city to Babylon. Babylon was a great city, great, great in the eyes of men. It's believed that Nineveh was basically a mighty fortress, that it had walls around the city 100 feet tall. You imagine that. <laughs> and towers. I think it said 1,500 towers, another 100 feet Taller than that. Amazing, huh? Now, I'd love to see it. <laughs> it truly was great in the eyes of men, but what'd God have to say about it? He said, they're wicked. Yeah. Wickedness has come up before me. And our Lord said the same thing. He said, that which is highly esteemed in the eyes of men is abomination yeah. in the sight of God. Yeah. When we look at Nineveh here, I want us to see this world, Crow, Kingsport, Princeton, wherever you are. But more than anything, Let's see ourselves. Yeah. Let's bring this home. All right. Now, I love this. If you have a Bible like mine or if you have a center margin, my, mine says by the word exceeding there in verse 3, it says of God. <laughs> Nineveh was an exceeding great city of God. And what that means is God had a people here. God had a people. Think of this wicked world. God has a people. Doesn't that encourage you yeah. to know God has a people here? You just turn the news on and you get so upset. I, I do. <laughs> Every day it seems like. And yet sometimes the Lord reminds me, I have a people here yeah. and I'm saving them. Yeah. <laughs> Gives me great hope in this world. God had a people here. That's why God sent Jonah here. Because they need to hear the gospel and call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. That's why he sent Jonah here. Verse 4 says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. said it took three days to walk through this city. You know, back in that day, they, they didn't just hop in the car and go for a spin. They, they had to walk. And it's believed Nineveh was about 60 miles long. 60 miles. Huge city. And took the average person three days to walk through it. It says Jonah was walking for one day. And I imagine after God commanded that fish to vomit out Jonah and it spat him out on dry land, I imagine he hopped right up and got with it. <laughs> and so he's walking a little quicker than average. And he, I can see him marching to the heart of that city. And buddy, did he start crying out against them. Yet 40 days. And God's going to overthrow this place. You're wicked in God's sight. And that's what we declare, isn't it? God is holy. Yeah. And we've sinned against Him. Yes. And He must, His yeah. justice demands it. He must overthrow us. He must destroy us. God's too holy to, to behold sin yeah. and iniquity. His eyes are too pure. Now, I mentioned that Jonah was a sign unto Nineveh. All we read that Jonah said here was, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But we know that's not all he said. Because when the gospel comes to us, it's good news, isn't it? Now we hear God's holy and He will punish sin, but we also hear Christ put our sin away. You think Jonah told them what happened to him? If he was a sign unto them, you think he told them about how the Lord put him in a whale's belly? I'm, I'm certain of it. As certain as I am standing here before you, I'm certain of it. He told them about God's judgment, but he told them about God's mercy. <laughs> That's the good news. That's the saving message when we hear of mercy and grace in Christ. It's the good news that sinners need. He declared unto them what he told us in Jonah 2 verse 10, salvation is of the Lord. I can just see him saying, do you need a Savior? <laughs> I do. Let me tell you about him. And what good news it is. You know, the, the TV message yesterday was it's appointed unto men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. We've sinned against God. The wages of sin is death. That's why we die. But there's a second death that many face in the judgment. 
we need someone to bear our sins. And it says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, of all his people chosen in Christ. Now, when God sends his prophet with this glorious message, here's what happens every time. Look at verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. <laughs> they had just heard the judgment of God proclaimed against them. They had just heard what sinners they are and what judgment and condemnation they deserve. And they believed God. Doesn't say they believed Jonah, but they sure did. <laughs> he was the instrument God used to tell them. They believed Jonah and they believed God. What that means is God saved them. For by grace are we saved through faith. What God used to save them, faith comes by hearing, they heard. Heard the word of God. If you just read this, you read verse 4 and 5 together pretty quickly. It just seems so casual. Jonah said 40 days and they believe God. But I hope we understand how miraculous that is. I hope we understand how amazing this is. You know, we, we can stand here, Walter, and preach message after message after message after message after message from God's Word. Preach Christ crucified over and over and over and over for years. And it won't have any effect on a person until God the Holy Spirit makes it effectual. He must make it. He must quicken us. We can do nothing. We can stand here and repeat God's Word day and night. But until God speaks to a sinner... God must be for any change to take place. And it shouldn't surprise us here that these men believe God. Some people believe the whole city believed God. I don't know. It says the people of Nineveh. <laughs> Could be all of them. I don't know. But it was a great number, I'm sure. And it shouldn't surprise us. You know, you, you preach and you... I feel like so, you know, so much time can go by before someone says, I believe that. <laughs> someone knew, I believe that. And then for one message for so many to fall flat on their face, like at the day of Pentecost when Peter preached and thousands hearts were pricked and they believed on Christ. It doesn't matter if one person believes or if thousands are believing. God said his word shall not return unto him void. He said it's going to accomplish that which I please, which he pleases. It's going to prosper in the thing whereto he sends it. <laughs> you see, this had nothing to do with Jonah. I hope we understand as we look at this, this had nothing to do with Jonah. <laughs> he didn't want to go in the first place. It was in spite of him. And if God's going to save a sinner through the preaching of the gospel, it's going to be in spite of us every time. Every time. In verse 5 again, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. I love reading that from the greatest of them, even unto the least of them. The king. Reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar, don't it? What God did for that wicked king. There's no one too sinful. No one too deep in the gutter for God to save. And there's none too self-righteous. There, there's none too steeped in religion. The Apostle Paul was as steeped as they come. Yeah. God saved him. Yeah. God saved me. God can save anybody. He's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by him. And when God saves us, it's, it's an effectual salvation. Yes, it it's a powerful salvation that we know nothing about until we experience it. You read what happened here. These people, they, they proclaim to fast. When you fast... You're denying yourself. What our Lord say? Deny yourself. They they put on sackcloth. That's humility. That's what Job did when God took everything from him. He he covered himself in sackcloth and he sat there in dust and ashes. And we read that's what this king did. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. You know, religion loves to, and this flesh by nature, loves to put on a show. Our Lord sees right through that. And we can't look to the outward acts as evidence. But I know this. When God saves us, we truly do repent. Mm -hmm. We don't think about God the same way we did before. Those sailors crying out into their gods, acting all pitiful, they didn't do that after God saved them. Right. 
they fear the Lord exceedingly. <laughs> they say, we're, we're going to vow to worship the Lord. And Jonah vowed the same thing. We're going to praise Him and Him alone. God's grace is effectual. Verse 7 says, And he, the king, he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. You don't let them eat or drink a thing. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast. You, you know, I, I wonder when I read this, why does it talk about the beasts? <laughs> it's literally talking about animals. But that's a good spiritual picture because that's what we are. People get scared to death talking about 666, the, the mark of the beast, the number of the beast. That's the number of man. That's us. We're beasts. By nature, we're this, this flesh, nothing but a beast before God. And it's a beast he must suppress. It, like the camel must go through the eye of the needle. This, this beast has got to be reduced to nothing. And that's what happened here. And I pray that's what will happen for us. Verse 8 says, Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. This beast must cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. This king sent out a decree. He ordered this entire great city to fall down flat on their face before God, to cry mightily unto God, to turn from their wicked way Turn to God. And we must. We, our Lord said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's right. That's right. We must repent. Yes. Yes, brother. Everything that this flesh, this carnal mind that's enmity against God, everything that this wicked flesh even thinks about God is an evil thought. Yes, it is. We, and we see it so clearly with false religion, putting man on the same level as God. But it's, it, I'm telling you, it's the same with me in my flesh today. The, the sinful thoughts I have about God that bring reproach and dishonor to His name, oh, may God forgive us. I need to repent constantly. Constantly. And this is our only hope, brethren, that we might cry mightily unto God, that God might put that cry in us, Amen. a cry that needs Him, like Jonah in chapter 2, to do something for us. Jonah, he may have thought he's going to perish in that whale's belly. But God brought him back. He brought him to the point of faith in Christ, to believing on Christ, to trusting in Christ, and not looking to himself and his desires. And God spat him out. He said, enough. <laughs> enough. Now you go to Nineveh. Now, this matter of repentance, we, we know this. But if, if we repent, it's, it's, it's not because of us. I, I, I can tell you things. We can talk about doctrines and different things. And... Uh, but the fact of the matter is our mind is not truly going to change about God until God gives us a new heart. Amen. God doesn't save us because we repent. It's backwards. Amen. We repent because God saves Amen. us. Amen. God, He said, a new spirit will I put in them. A new heart will I give them. Yeah. And that's what He does. Yeah. I love this verse. It says, before they call, I will answer. Yeah. You know, it's like a baby crying. That's the evidence that life has been given, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's the evidence. Faith is the evidence. I love how our Lord said, I will be their God, <laughs> and they shall be my people. Amen. Not if, <laughs> period. Period. I will and they shall. I love thinking about, I mentioned the Apostle Paul, when he described his conversion. You can read about it, Galatians 1. I'll just read it to you. He said, when it pleased God, <laughs> who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. He said, when God did that, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. <laughs> I didn't have to sit down and think about it. <laughs> well, it's like our Lord, He told Peter, you know, asked him who He was. He said, thou art the Christ. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. You're blessed because I revealed it to you. <laughs> I love this too. God hath saved us. He hath. It's already done hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Our works had nothing to do with us. With it. He saved us in spite of our works. Amen. Because our works were wicked and not going to please God, that's why He sent Christ to save us from our works. His wonderful works. That's the only wonderful works there are. Yeah. It said he, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. And that was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. Yeah. 
This thing was done and settled before you and I were ever a thought in our parents' minds. <laughs> what I see when I read Jonah chapter 3, and really the whole book, I, I see God was pleased to save a people, and He saves each and every one of them on purpose. Amen. Old, old Barnard, he taught Henry the purpose of God, didn't he? <laughs> oh, if we ever learn about that, we'll, we'll learn everything there is to learn, yeah. everything we need to know. Now look here what, what this king said in, in verse 9. He said, who can tell? <laughs> oh my, that's the question, isn't it? Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? What they're saying is we're at the mercy of God. Who can tell if God might have mercy on us? Who can tell if God might be gracious to us? and do for us what we can't do for ourselves. See, the fact of the matter is, and it's so for us, God must destroy us. We've sinned against Him. He hates sin more than anything. God is jealous. The Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. He's reserved wrath unimaginable for His enemies, His adversaries. The foolish aren't going to stand in His sight. He hates all workers of iniquity, and that's what we are. Well, what's our hope? Well, it's like He's saying... Will God turn and repent? And I'll tell you this, God changes not. The repenting that he's talking about, God, he sighs, he comforts. Like again, you, I'm a father now, so you, you see your child do something they shouldn't do. I'm, I'm starting to see it. <laughs> and you, you, initially you get angry. But you're my child. <laughs> You've been my child. I love you. And I'm going to correct you as my child. That's God's repentance. It's not, well, I guess I won't punish him. He corrects us lovingly. We were his children from eternity. We are his children. And he's going to preserve us as his children. And we're going to be in his kingdom as his children. God's repentance don't mean he changes mind. <laughs> not at all. Nonetheless, that's the question. Will he turn and repent? Will he turn from his fierce anger that we perish not? Let me ask you this. Can he do this? Can God turn from His anger? Let me ask you this. Is God able to make us perish not? I can tell you, I, there ain't nothing I can do to keep myself from perishing. Right. Nothing I can do. Here's the, here's the fact of the matter. Here's the truth of the matter. In order for me to be saved, in order for me to stand accepted in God's sight, my sin has got to be dealt with. Yeah. Got to be. And I can't deal with it. God cannot. Now, please, I hope your ears perk up the fact that I'm saying God can't. Okay, Always pay attention when, when we say God can't. But here's a, here's a fact. God cannot not be angry at sin. He cannot not be angry at sin. He hates it with every fiber of his being. It is contrary to who he is yeah. and what he loves. Amen. What that means is God's not going to save us by overlooking our sin. Right. He's not going to wink at our sin. He's not going to sweep it under the rug like I do when I sweep. Yeah. <laughs> God's not like us. He's not like us. God can't do that. can't do it. Sin must be punished. All of it. And God's holy, righteous jealousy and anger must be satisfied. It has to be. Absolutely has to be. So here's, here's the conclusion. In order for Nineveh to be saved, someone's going to have to satisfy God for them. And here's what I rejoice to tell you. Someone did. <laughs> Someone did. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs> The Lord Almighty, God Almighty, the Savior of sinful man. Yes. Now, I must acknowledge this as well. Nineveh, you can read about in detail their destruction that would come in the book of Nahum. I believe Zephaniah wrote about it too, and maybe some others. But God would one day destroy Nineveh. Mm -hmm. He would. Yeah. And God will one day destroy this earth, yeah. this world. He said it's all going to be passed away. He's going to burn it up with a ball of fire. He, Peter wrote about it. But you know, before he does that, something's going to happen first. 
He's going to call out every single one of his chosen people. Amen. And they're going to do exactly what the Ninevites did and fall on their face believing God, yeah. <laughs> calling out for mercy, mm -hmm. trusting Christ alone for all their hope of salvation. Yeah. You see, I must be destroyed because of my sin, but Christ was destroyed in my place. He said, destroy this temple, talking about himself. And in three days, I'll raise it again. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And as he rose again, we're going to rise again in him. Amen. Perfect with him, conformed to his image forever and ever. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now look here, the last verse, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, And God saw their works before he saw their wickedness. Now God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. He didn't change his mind. He purposed to save them from eternity. But his word comes to us and tells us what we deserve and what Christ suffered for us. He spared Nineveh for Christ's sake. Not for their sake. I guess it was for their sake. But ultimately, it's, he saves us for Christ's sake. It, concerning Lazarus, he said this is for the glory of the Son of God, that the Son of God might be glorified yeah. thereby. This is for His glory. Yeah. We're to the praise of His glory. Amen. <laughs> but it's certainly for our good too. God saw their works. What did He see? Well, He saw their faith, didn't He? Mm -hmm. He saw that it was true, God-given faith. Faith that looked to Christ alone. Mm -hmm. Trusted and rested in Christ alone. He saw it. And uh, I, I'm glad he saw it because I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see it in myself. I like to think I can, but I can't see it in us. I, I think only God can see this. Only God truly knows the heart. He knows the heart he gives. Their repentance, their humility, their fasting, all of it. All of this was the result of what God did for them. All of this was the result of Christ being in them, the hope of glory. All of this was the result of God working in them. <laughs> to will, and to do of his good pleasure. That's what he saw, and that's why he spared them not, because he saw them in Christ. He saw them under the blood of Jesus Christ. And God's well pleased with that. He's well pleased with his son and all in him. Now I want to show you one more thing in closing. Turn over to Luke chapter 11. We don't just have the book of Jonah. We have the Lord mention this specific instance to confirm what I'm telling you. Luke 11, verse 32. Luke 11, 32. He, he had just told these religious men that jo there's going to be the sign of Jonah. That's the sign. All right. He also mentions Solomon and the queen of Sheba. All right. Well, in verse 32, here's what he said. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation or against this generation and shall condemn it. Those wicked sinners God saved are going to rise up and condemn the religious world. Here's why. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now here's the key. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Anytime we stand to preach God's word, if something happens, if we're blessed by it, if God saves us through it, a greater than Jonah is here. I pray by God's grace and by His Spirit that today a greater than Jonah is here, just like there was when, when Jonah went preaching to Nineveh. Oh, may God truly do for us what He did for the men of Nineveh. For Christ's sake and His glory. Amen.